Good afternoon, friends. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. And of course, today is Sunday. It is a day that many of you have already gone and uh, to your uh, perhaps your local church. Uh, maybe you go to a synagogue uh, or wherever you may go to uh, celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, it is a beautiful day for that. In fact, here in Tennessee, we had nothing but cloudy, overcast weather, very nasty, very cold, in fact. Uh, we were running in the 40s, low 40s here. Uh, and here we are in the springtime, and we're having winter weather. And then Sunday, it all cleared up. Uh, and I have been preparing part two of this Passover message that I wanted to share with you. And uh, we are going to back up just a little bit here. And uh, still pick back up with Barabbas and Jesus. Uh, and then we're going to move right through the scriptures here, through the crucifixion. And uh, I'm, I'm definitely, though, what I'm going to be saying to you today is not traditional. It is completely different. And unfortunately, even before I come on to prepare the broadcast for you, just in a moment of prayer, as I was asking the Father's help to deliver this message to you, I realized that the only people that will truly receive this message are those that are elect of God, that are able to receive it. At the same time, it's going to be a message that is going to cut very deep. It's going to cause many people to have to step back and question where they are. What is their role in the modern days that we're living in? Because truly there is a scripture, and we're going to go to it here in just a moment, in the New Testament, uh, it's actually, let's see, maybe I'll just pull it up real quick here. Um, goodness, I hope, here we go. Nope, that's Genesis. Goodness, where did I put it at? Uh, where, you cru where the people crucified Jesus Christ afresh. Yes, yeah, actually in the book of Hebrews. Um, and I, I think I want to start with this passage just to have that in our minds. Uh, but we're going to go much deeper in the book of Hebrews as well. We're going to have to back up a chapter, go into this one, and then go forward a chapter. And I think before we start, I, I really, uh, I like to pray before coming on, but I, I think what we do, what we should do is we should pray together uh, about this message so that it'll be more of a benefit to you. Heavenly Father, I am the most unworthy servant there is, Lord, to bring forth the things that I'm about to share with the people. I know, no doubt, Lord, one day this may cost me my life. There have been two attempts already made. My wife has also had an attempt made on hers for the very things that I will share with people today. And Jesus, you said when, when you were here on this earth, if they persecuted you and you are the master of the house, how much more will they persecute us? And you even said in their synagogues. So we shouldn't expect anything different. I ask so, Father, with the most sincerest heart I can, Lord. Father, first forgive me of my own shortcomings in life. And I ask, dear God, that you will open the ears of those that will listen today, Father. I pray, dear God, with faith praying, Lord, asking you, Lord, that their ears will be open, Lord, and that if they have found themselves on the wrong side, that they will... Uh, just seek sincerely you and to go on the right side for this battle is not going to be an easy one in the name above every name the most precious of all the Lord Jesus Christ I pray 
And for those that look for your name in the Hebrew tongue, dear God, I would say, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, and Yeshua L'Rocha Adonai. Be Adonai. Ezranu Kol Anashim. Amen. So, just for those of you that may not have understood that last little part of the prayer, I was just asking and, and when praying in the name of Jesus Christ in the Hebrew language, that God would uh, help help us, um, uh, and I forget exactly everything I said, but basically to help us uh, to, to you know I didn't go into the knowing or anything, but that, that doesn't really matter. Let's let's get right into this. This is like I said, this is really a very serious message, and I. I started off in the book of Hebrews there, and this is where I wanted to start with you at. Um, and we read here, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go uh, on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Now, by the way, that has nothing to do with, I right, hear right, for, let's read verse 2 so I get it for you. Of the doctrine of baptism and the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and the internal judgment. All right. They say, laying these things aside, right? Not, not laying again, excuse me, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Of the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Okay. This is nothing to do with what most people think. This is he's actually dealing with the law, is what he's doing. Even when we look at the word baptism, uh, you know, it was it's you know the mikvah, the the washing in the pool of the water before coming into the temple was a custom. So water baptism in the New Testament really is kind of like part of a custom, uh, you know. And so all these things here is what he's talking about. But we'll get into that later. For, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. He's literally talking about you fall away, you go into apostasy, you go back to the law. And when you do that, you crucify Jesus Christ afresh, anew. And you put him to an open shame. Now, the reason why I'm going to get into this and the reason why I'm bringing that passage out in the book of Hebrews here is because Jesus Christ is the Melchizedek for us. He is the high priest. He entered into the Holy of Holies for you already once and for all. But what's happening is what's going on in the world today and we have to bring this out because Jesus Christ is being crucified afresh because of the push that is happening to rebuild the third temple. And I know many of you that know that the third temple has to be rebuilt, the Antichrist, etc. I get that. And that's the only reason why you say, you know, brother, that's why we believe it's got to be built. But there are many evangelical ministers that are so supportive of the, of the government of Israel, the rabbis of Israel, the... Uh, you know, and, and I am not against people that want to support the Jewish people. Please don't misunderstand me when I say that. I think we should support the Jewish people, but not to the extent where you compromise the word of God and you take and you go into apostasy. Because that's what Paul is talking about. You know, you, you have tasted the good word of God, the powers of the world to come, and you fall away to renew again into repentance. What am I speaking about here? This is those that would actually be willing to support the state of Israel, the building of the third temple, and that the law is to come out of Jerusalem. And you're saying to the Jewish people, well, you have Yahweh to be your God, and we have Jesus to be our God. So we have two different types of laws here, but it's okay. We're there to support you. We want to make sure that the law comes out of Jerusalem. You're trying to win them to Christ, not to take and go be partakers of the old system. And we're going to get into that because it has everything to do with the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ as well. All right. Now, as I said, 
initially, what we had is we had with Jesus and Barabbas, what was happening right before the crucifixion, Pilate asked the people, which one? It was a custom. Let one go. I, I, saw, I was looking at some of the comments. There's one guy, he, I brought up how the presidents always pardon him. He said, yeah, and they also pardon the turkeys. They get two turkeys. One they're going to eat and the other one they're going to let free, right? And I'm like, boy, that's a very good, <laughs> that was a very good analogy as well, right? But it's also a mockery, though, in a way. And uh, and there were some people, too, that took up for Jonathan. And, I, and, and like I said, I, I'm not here to beat up Jonathan on the issue. I get the point that he's making, the scapegoat, the, the sacrificial goat, etc. But, but he does come in one place, and I didn't play the part there, where he says, you know, in a way, it's not that the Jews were doing a bad thing. They were calling on the son of the father. But the problem is, he's not the son of the true father. He was the son of the devil. Just as it says in the Hebrew Matthew, it's not son, uh, ba, uh, ba, excuse me, bar Abba, but bar Baesh, the son in the fire. And I think that's kind of an interesting note. And I, I realize some people, they don't, they, they get kind of offensive. There's one, one brother that, you know, because he's used to King James and he's used to only that. And it's like, you know, you know, we appreciate that you understand this, but you know, we don't, you know, we appreciate the fact that we understand too. I'm not discounting anybody's knowledge in these types of things here. The point is, is it's looking at both sides of the picture because granted, we don't know which one is correct. Is it Barabbas as the Bar Abba, which still would make no difference because even if it was, it's still, you know, as we see, according to the scriptures, Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil and his works you will do. So uh, they were calling on the very devil's son in, in that case, right? Uh, or is it Barbaresh? You know, but pronounced Barbaras because like I said, the way they had done the, uh, there was two different ways that it was written in the Hebrew Matthew and one is son in the fire, but it's still pronounced like Bar Barabbas. Uh, anyway, it doesn't make any difference. The point in this case here is that in the Hebrew Matthew, he actually, we see that he murdered women or a woman in this case here. He was guilty of the death of a woman and he was a lunatic. He was a madman. And when the when the Pharisees they had they had got got the people to call for the release of Barabbas and to crucify Jesus. Now I find that very striking. Very striking. They persuaded the people to kill Jesus and to set the murderer free. In this case here, because he had killed a woman, it to me, it types the fact that that murderous spirit is to kill the church, the bride of Christ. Think about it. Think about that, right? Now, another interesting aspect that we could look at on this too is, and I put some images up here for you to think about, right? Here we go here. Now, President Trump, no different than anybody else, right? I'm not picking on one president or the other. Doesn't make any difference. Here you have the Chabad organization here, and what are they doing? They're signing the law, uh, something 102, I forget the exact number for it, which is the education law, which is for the Noahide laws. And in those Noahide laws, as I said to you before, uh, it calls for the punishment is capital punishment by beheading that is written in the Talmud, exactly where those seven Noahide laws come from. And, and if you just read the seven Noahide laws, they do seem to look more like the Ten Commandments. That's why most people think nothing of it. They think, oh, it's no big deal, right? But those seven Noahide laws have all those sub-laws in the same book where they were taken from, the Talmud, written by Rambam. And in those sub-laws, it caused idolatry. And, of course, they name Christians as idolaters. Um, and that they are to be killed by beheading. If you worship Jesus as the Son of God, or believe Him to be the Son of God, you're guilty of idolatry. Do you remember the scripture in Matthew here, right? Let's let's go back to Matthew. All right. Judas is repenting for the 30 pieces of silver. Um, 
They, 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 okay, which is for the governor. The governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. Uh, so actually, I think it's in the cha previous chapter, chapter 26, what I'm looking for here. So let me back up one chapter. Because uh, what I'm looking for, hang on. Hmm. We're going to betray him. We got all that. Uh, they betrayed him. The, you know, the, let's see. Uh, goodness, here we go. Hang on. I actually lost my thought on it, but I'll, as soon as I find the scripture, I'll, I'll get my thought back on it. Um, okay. Oh, goodness. Yeah, I lost my thought on that for a second. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Now here it is. This is I, did, I got it back again. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answer thou nothing, right? Because the, the false witness said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. But verse 63, But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. It wasn't because of tearing down the temple and building it in three days, even though he's only referring to his body, and he never said he would do it. He said, destroy this temple. In other words, if you destroy it, I'll build it in three days. He's talking about his body, all right? But nonetheless, when did the high priest decide that he was worthy of death? When he claimed to be the son of Almighty God. So if you say that Jesus Christ is the son of God, and you believe that, what do you think the Pharisees of today would say about your beliefs? Do you think they're going to change? Not a bit. You will be, behold now you have heard his blasphemy. Verse 65. Blasphemy is punishable by death decapitation according to Talmudic writings. And it said, and what you thank you that this high priest asking all of the people that are gathered. They answered and said, he is guilty of death. So do you think for one moment that anything is going to change for you? And then there's those out there that are saying, Stephen Ben Danu ought to know that uh, you know, there's these seven Noahide laws are, 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 are not no big deal and, and that's not really what it's meant by it and, and no, they're not going to do this and they're not going to do that. Let me tell you something and I'm going to tell you right now and I'm going to hold my peace on this because this will come out in a different way. Myself and my wife were nearly killed because of these Noahide laws. I know this from one of the highest ranks you can possibly get in the government that we were targeted. My father-in-law paid with his life. We were all three targeted. 21 mils of peroxide injected into your veins is extremely deadly. And it's also symbolic. In my opinion, that's my opinion. 21 mils of peroxide is symbolic to me of the 21st degree Mason who is called a Noahide Mason and is considered to be the executioner for those that violate the Noahide laws. I'm going to leave that right there. I'm not going to say any names or anything else at this point. I'm just going to leave it there. So when I take this personally, I take it very personal. All right, this is a very serious situation. Now, also, I want you to notice here we are, and 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 listen. Let me back up for a moment to the Chabad picture here. 
I have many friends that are Chabad's and Chabad rabbis as well. I developed the friendship because I used to be part of their group. And many, many good people that are there in this organization that would never for them for a moment want to bring harm to anyone. It is a it is a minority, and I will agree with that, even against my accusers, I will agree it is a minority that even wants to pass such strict reforms in Israel. Sure it is, but they're in power. All right. Now, if you'll notice here, in order to be, by the way, if you ever listen to Nehemiah Gordon, Nehemiah will tell you he was an Orthodox Jew. He said, in order to be an Orthodox rabbi, you have to be able to prove in your lineage that your father's 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 father, going all the way back, was a Pharisee. I've played it many a time for you. And if you notice the Pharisees and the power they have with political leaders. And of course, in the behind Putin is Menachem Schneerson, the famous Rebbe that they believe to be the Mashiach. This is the head rabbi of Russia. He's an American, but he's the head rabbi of Russia. Very close f- friend of Putin. Edward Hudo, when he flew, remember the, the, the message I did for that? He's flying to Israel during the delegation meeting, finds out Putin was just getting ready to come into power. It was a cousin of another rabbi. Or not a rabbi, but another a cousin of another Jewish man that was a politician from Ukraine. And they and Edward Hudo brings in how that when Putin came into power, it looks like he was getting rid of all these uh, elite Jews and oligarchs out of Russia. But Edward Hudo said no, he was there. And Edward Hudo happened to be a Chabad Jew as well. Also had met with Menachem Schneerson, the man in the back, more than one occasion, right? Just like, and there, there's, there's where you meet them. You'd meet him in New York. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu met with him. He was asking him, what was he doing to bring about the usher and the coming of the Mashiach? And he says, we're trying. And he says, you need to do more. You know, a lot could be said about that. Right? But look at all these connections. Both spiritual leaders as well as political leaders, right? And at the same time, it was no difference in the days of Jesus. The Pharisees had a very powerful influence over government leaders. Pilate did not want to kill Jesus. His wife said to him, I have suffered many things. In the the Greek, we have this day. In the Hebrew, Matthew, we have that night. That night she'd had these dreams and everything about uh, uh, Jesus. And she said, have nothing to do with this righteous man. And in the Greek, the word can also be translated as a righteous man. But a tumult, an uproar, in other words, had began. And Pilate knew that he wasn't going to be able to get anything done unless he served the interest of the Pharisees, even if it meant putting Jesus Christ to death and letting a murderer go. You think it's changed? It hasn't changed one bit. And right now, look at the tumult that is happening in the world today. Look at Ukraine. Look at the whole Middle East. One man, one man has helped cause that. When this man here, Mr. Schneerson, says to him, what are you doing to bring about the coming of the Mashiach? And he said, we're doing all we can. He said, you need to do, I forget exact, the exact words, but you need to do more. The Frankist Sabbatean doctrine, do more evil so that the Mashiach will come. And he began to pound the beating drums of war. The Barabbas spirit. He did it before our Congress. 
He did it before the presidents and all the wars that are going on practically on this planet, including Putin going into Ukraine, is being controlled by a group of men that have such powerful influence over government leaders. No difference than it was 2,000 years ago. And not just with Pilate. When they accused Pilate, they said, if you do not do this, you are no friend of Caesar. So they also had controls with Caesar in Rome. Now, you would argue, well, Brother Steve, Titus comes down there and destroys Jerusalem and the temple and everything. Look a little bit about the history. Titus didn't want the blame of destroying the temple. There were some folks that wanted to make sure they were in power and they helped those get into the temple. A lot could be said there. I'm going to leave that alone for a moment. Let's move forward. Okay, we are in. Okay, so there again, like I said, <laughs> blasphemy, right? Just for saying that Jesus was the Son of God, and that's going to be a capital punishment. Yeah, I take it very seriously, friends. All right, so we move on down. Now let's go into the next chapter. We're in chapter 27. Right? Judas, we see that he had betrayed him. He, he knew he'd betrayed innocent blood. And unfortunately, many of us wake up too late for that. But I, I'm hoping that we won't. Um. Now, and Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, You say it. And when he was accused of the chief priests and the elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hear us, uh, hear, hear you not how many things they witness against you? And he answered him, Never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now, at that feast, the governor was wont to release into the people a prisoner whom they would, and they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. And therefore, when they gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will you that I would release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man. That righteous man. All right, where, where did all right, all right? Let me back up to this so I get this right because I don't want to miss this for you. And when he was set down at the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have not, thou nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Now, if you look here in the Greek as well, we find that that is also uh, verse 19. Here we go, just man. Look right down to the very last one. Just meet righteous or right or righteous man is what it was. Now, there's a purpose for me bringing this out. Not just a just man, but a righteous man. All right. If we go to the Hebrew as well in verse 19, uh, I implore you that no matter should you speak a word against this righteous man. Because in this night I have suffered many things in a vision because of him. Uh, and... Uh, over here, let's see here. Okay, Sadiq, right there. Sadiq is the righteous, the righteous man there, all right? So uh, it was, he was a righteous man there. And the reason I, I wanted to, this to be out there because Mel, Melchizedek, see, Melchizedek, see, he is, he is the righteous one. Um, and let me just see real quick because I've made myself some notes on these things and I don't want to forget these things. So bear with me one moment. Yeah, that's it. I remember now exactly right. Right. And the re and reason being is because he was the, uh, uh, Melchizedek was called the king of Salem, the king of righteousness. And uh, so I thought that was befitting because as we're looking at all these things here, we know that besides that uh, Pilate's wife calls him a righteous man, and then Pilate also is asking him, is he the king of the Jews? And in reality, that is exactly what this all comes down to because in the book of Hebrews, 
right? This is where I said you're, the people are crucifying Jesus Christ afresh because you're going back to the law. You're, you're taking and you're trying to restore, believing that Jesus was not the fulfillment of what? Isaiah chapter 2. Maybe we should read Isaiah 2 before I get into this. This, this is going to be a lengthy message, friends, so please forgive me. Bear with me on this, um, but I think it's important. Right now, many, I mean, you have to understand, and, and this part, I don't fault Jewish people on this because I realize the Jewish people believe that Jesus Christ didn't fulfill Scripture. They don't believe that he was the Messiah. So for them, I don't have a problem with them believing that they have to have a third temple, they have to have the Messiah come, etc. Where I have problems is when Christians are supporting something like this, totally not realizing that they're putting Christ to an open shame and crucifying him afresh because they're they're basically lifting the Pharisees back up on the throne and putting them in power. See, watch. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Wow. The law is going to go forth. The word from Jerusalem. All nations are going to come. All right. Did we forget about, okay, have we forgotten that in Acts Right? And we got to just quickly look at this. Acts chapter 2. Right? Here we are on the day of Pentecost. And we got the sound of the Russian mighty wind. And uh, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of all every nation under heaven. All nations were there. And then it names them even. The, the Perithians, the Medes, the Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia. Figure, it goes right on down. All You get all the way, all these nations in there. All the known nations of the time. They were gathered there. So Isaiah was truly being fulfilled then. Right? This was truly being fulfilled. And then if you look in the book of Hebrews... And we go, if you, let's just back up real quick. Before we get into this laying, you know, the, you know, these dead, dead works and stuff. In chapter five, Paul's writing for every high priest taken from among men is ordained of, of four men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity? Talking about the priest. And by reason hereof, he ought as the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten you. And as he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay? Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from the death and was heard and that he feared. Though he were a son and yet learned obedience by things which he suffered and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation and to all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when... For the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are sure of a full age, even those who by reasons of use have their senses exercised and discern both good and evil. And then he continues, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again foundation of repentance of dead works and faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism, of laying on hands and the resurrection of the dead, of eternal judgment. 
And then we get down a little further, verse 5, and have tasted the, you know, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good work of God, the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. That's why I'm trying to stress to you, don't support the Zionist movement. God will have mercy on a Jewish person that does this because he realized he still is walking in blindness to this day. But for you, he will not have that mercy. Now, I believe there is a window of mercy open even now for you. But don't continue to go repent and pull away from that and stand with Jesus Christ. Because when you do that, you are denying that Jesus Christ is the true high priest. You deny him to be the Melchizedek. You deny him to be your uh, king of righteousness. You deny the fact that he has actually gone into the Holy of Holies for you. Why do you think the veil of the temple was rent in twain when he died? He was showing that he tore the veil. He was able to go in. He was able once and for all to put an end to all of this for you. And I'm going to get into all of that here in just a moment. Now, mm, we got, all right, so then if you continue on though, and we could have read all of this here. Let me, let me read the last two before I jump to the next chapter. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us, has us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All right. Then you got, you go into this chapter seven. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to read some of it here though. Okay. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation, king of righteousness. After that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor ending of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Think about that. No father, no mother. No descent, no genealogy. Let's drop down to verse 6. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promise. All right, it's talking about Levi. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed to the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. All right. Now, let's see. Let me start with verse 12 here. For the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity, a change also of the law. Now we're talking about Isaiah 2. All right, let's just look real quick. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Okay. So there must be a necessity of a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. And is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testified, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but bringing into a uh, in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. When that veil was torn in half, that's what give you access. And insomuch as without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath. But this was an oath by him that saith unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Now do you see why he writes in here in chapter 6, 
that if you fall away to renew again unto repentance, in other words, if you're going to go back to that law, you crucify to yourselves the Son of God afresh. And this is, this is exactly what Christian leaders are doing today, right? This is the likes of, uh, uh, of Hagee and the rest of them. Evangel this is in 2010. Evangelical support for Israel at all-time high. The fact that Netanyahu knee-deep and contentious talks with Palestinians over freeze on Israeli settlements and construction found time to meet Hagee's contingent speaks volumes about the ties between the Israeli officials and evangelical Christians. That year alone, some $70 million in 2009, excuse me, one of those International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, that's not even, that's not even John Hagee's group, raised $70 million and another $30 million to Jewish causes in the former Soviet Union and elsewhere. Like I said, helping Jewish people, I don't have a problem with that at all, you know. There's people that need help everywhere. Palestinians need help. Uh, Jewish people need help. Syrians need help. Humanity needs help as a whole. War devastated people, both in Ukraine, on both sides of that war, need help. But in Ukraine right now, Zelensky's government is imprisoning priests if they're Orthodox Russian uh, because they're Christians, but, but they're not <laughs> Western Christians. How ridiculous. Back to Matthew. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And that's what's happening today. The evangelical leaders and messianic leaders of this world that are claiming the name of Jesus Christ are persuading the people persuading you to call upon Barabbas to be released and Jesus to be crucified. You don't realize it, but that's what you're doing. If you're supporting the Zionist movement, if you're supporting the movement that brings in a Noahide law system, you're supporting Barabbas. The very murderer that killed a woman that will kill the bride of Christ. So do I take it personally? I sure do. Let's see. Now, we move on down. I want to I want to kind of wrap this up, but I want to wrap it up in a couple of things that the Lord has shown me as well. I got such a blessing putting this message together and, and some amazing things that God has shown me. So when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather atonement was made. In other words, there was, there was an uproar happening. And he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, this righteous man. See you to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Boy, has it ever, has it ever. And I've actually was the one person that began years ago, many years ago, I actually said in a way it was a good thing because at least the blood of Christ has kept them protected. Um, I know though you can't have his blood on you. You need his blood in you. That's why he said to his disciples, when he held up the cup, at the at the Passover and he said this behold this is my blood drink it drink all of it it was to go in them it was symbolic but it was to go in them representing the very life of Christ dwelling within them even the very oh I'm going to get into that in a moment let me let me wait then they released 
Then he released Barabbas into them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. I want to show you something. Something that is very beautiful that you're going to see here. Here we have a, a picture, and I don't know who did the picture, and this is supposedly depicting what they did with Jesus with the scarlet robe, the crown of thorns. Many, many years ago, I guess some 12 years ago, I spoke about the crown of thorns and that when Jesus was on the cross and he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He's saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he spoke in an unknown tongue. Didn't speak in Hebrew, didn't speak in English. It was an unknown tongue. That's why even the Jews didn't know for sure. They said he calls on Elias. No, he was calling on his father saying, why have you forsaken me? Now, I caught something new, and that's what I wanted to be able to share with you today, and I thought it'd be a blessing for you as well. Um... Let's see here. That is, let's see, that's one of the ones, but it's actually Exodus. This here, in Exodus chapter 3, and uh, and just for a traditional sake there, I'm going to read a little bit to you in the Hebrew language, and then we'll speak about it in the English language, the verse 2, but I'll start with verse 1. Umoshe hayaro et atzion, itro hatono kohen midian, ve yenachag, את הציון אחר המדבר ויבא אל האלוהים חורבה ואירא מלך יחובה אליו right? and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame בלבת אש מתוך הסנאי a flame in the midst of the bush ואירא והנה הסנאי Be'er be'esh. Ve'hesene e'nein, excuse me, e'neinu ochel. So literally saying that the, the bush is not eaten, but it's the, we use the word consumed. Now, this is where Moses meets God. And of course, out of the flame of the fire, the midst of the bush, he looked and behold, the bush burned. Let me read a little further down for you, though. And Moses said, I will turn aside now and see this great sight why the bush is not burned. Why is it not burnt? And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God and called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Ve'yomer hineni. And he said, Draw not nigh and hither. The Yomer El Tikra Halum shall Nalecha me alweglecha ki hamakum asha ata o med aleav adamat kodeshu. And he says, Put off your shoes from off your feet for the place where whereon thou standest is holy ground. And moreover, he said, Yomer Anochi Elochai Evohe Avicha. He said, I am the God of thy father. I always thought that was interesting that God says this to Moses because Moses had always wondered who his father really was. You remember he was given up as a little child and raised by the daughter of Pharaoh. So that must have caused a little question mark in his mind. Was he really a Hebrew or was he really the daughter of Pharaoh? He says, Elohai Abraham, Elohai Yitzhak, the Elohai Yaakov, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. They stared at Moshe, and Moses hid his face. Be penav ki yore mehabit el ha Elohim, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people that are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their pains. 
And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of, out of that land into a good land, a large and to a land flowing with milk and honey, and to the place of the Canaanite, Hittite, and the Amorite, the Perizzite, Hivite, and Jebusite. And now, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. Moreover, I have seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you unto Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Mi anochi, who am I, that I should go unto Pharaoh, ki alecha el paro, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel? And he said, Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be a token unto you that I have sent you. When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Hine, Anochi ba el bene Yisrael. Behold, when I come into the children of Israel, ve'amati lehem elochai avotechem shelachani aleichem. And when I come into the children of Israel, they shall say unto me, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. Excuse me. I shall say unto them, The God of your fathers of Israel has sent me unto you. Shelachani eleyachem ve'amuli mashemo. What they they sent me to unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Maome eleyachem. And God said unto Moses, Ve'yomer elehim el Moshe. Ihaye asha ihaye ve'yomer ko ta'amar levne Yisrael ihaye shelachani aleichem. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And He said, Thus shall you say unto them, the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now I read all this for a purpose. The I am is exactly what Jesus said. To the children of Israel. And I'm going to show you. Because he says something very profound. He says to them. Except. John 8.24. Let me bring it up on the screen for you big. So we can see this better. So we're going to go to John. John. The gospel of John. The most powerful New Testament gospel in my opinion. I think we said verse 24. Maybe not. Let me just see real quick. 8. Yeah, 8.24. Make sure we're in chapter 8 and I didn't mess up. Yep, John chapter 8. Okay, I'm going to back up to verse 23. And he said unto them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am, notice the word he is italicized, you shall die in your sins. He didn't say I am he, he said, for if you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins. He claimed to be the very one who was in that burning bush. They also, they said, one other point, they said, you're a man under 50 years old and you say you've seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And that's another one. And I'll just quickly pull that one up to you for you as well. That's also John chapter 8. And we got to go all the way down to verse 58 for that one. So he's dealing with this whole issue during this whole chapter here. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to cast him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now the reason why I want to bring this out to you, though, is not just to make that argument there, but mainly because there's some beautiful analogies in there. And if you've never, if you've only been listening for the last few years or whatever, you probably never heard me talk about this. One, all right, we have to go back to the Hebrew here in Genesis, and we find out not not I'm sorry, Exodus, not Genesis. I'm going to get to the Genesis too. 
But when we see up here, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. The word Sinai is a bramble bush. It is a thorn bush. He's in the midst of the fire. In other words, the, the angel of the Lord, which is the angel aspect here, is actually the, uh, the, the amber light. It is just a form. It's a messenger form. All right? And appears there. And, and, and God spoke out of the midst of that fire to the children of Israel out of the midst of a thorn bush. And here we have Jesus when they put this robe on him, it represented that color of that fire, that fire of the thorn bush. And the crown of thorns that was plated upon his head are the, are the very thorns from a bramble bush. And here we had him as a, they mocked him and made fun of him. But the very I am was once again in the midst of a thorn bush clothed and wrapped in the flame of fire in a similitude of a picture. And they missed it. They missed it. This is why I'm working on the book, What Have Rabbis Missed? One of the reasons are beautiful stories like this. And for the believer that is listening to my voice today, if you have accepted him as the king of righteousness, the king of shalom, he is the Melchizedek. He is the high priest that has entered into the veil on your behalf. To the Holy of Holies. I want to leave you with this right here. I want to take you, and we go to Matthew's gospel now. Actually, we know that he is crucified. Um... They passed by, reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save yourself. If you be the Son of God, come down from the cross. They didn't understand that his death had to be done in order to pay the price. Satan had laid a claim on the souls of man. That deals with the fall in the Garden of Eden. And we're going to just lightly touch on it. I've done many videos on it. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him, the scribes and the elders said, he saved others himself, he cannot, he cannot save. If he be the king of the Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Yeah, but you wanted to put him to death for that. In fact, if anything, the miracle would be let him rise up. Just like the two witnesses. The two witnesses, their dead bodies, they're killed. They lay in the street for three days and three nights. And why are they not put in graves? I've, been, I've taught this for how many years now? More than 10 years? They're not put in the graves because, see, Jesus was put in a grave. This time, God's going to make sure you know that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is true. That'll be a testimony against those so-called Christians that have crucified Christ afresh. Because supporting this movement that brings about the Noahide laws will also bring about their death. But as I said in closing, let me go ahead and take you to John's Gospel because that's where we'll really get into this. Remember after Jesus rose from the grave, he went up. He said to Mary Magdalene and to Mary, go tell my disciples I, where I would meet him at, right? He tells them about that. We'll pick up verse 20 here, and we're in chapter 20 of John's gospel. And when he had said, he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them, again, peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. No wonder why there was a rushing mighty wind on the day of Pentecost. 
cloven tongue set upon each one of them like a fire. Again, the I am had came to them. And isn't it interesting that when we read in Genesis, then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Ve'itzad Yehovah Elohim et ha'adam afar min ha'adamah. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Ipak be'pa'av nishmat chayim. Ve'yahi ha'adam le'nefesh chaya. And man became a living soul. Unbelievable. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the chaim. And if you'll notice, the chaim is in the plural form right there. But man, Adam in this case, was chaya, singular. The life singular. But plural was breathed into him. Why? Because Eve was in there. Just like John the Baptist come forth from the womb filled with the Holy Spirit, so he, he had to. He represented the bride of Christ. So Eve came forth from her husband, never had nobody to breathe in her nostrils. She came forth filled with the Spirit of God. And what is that chayim? It is the fruit of the tree of life right here. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Ve'ez ha'chaim. Chaim. That life. Betok ha'ga'an. Ve'ez ha'da'ad to'ov ve'ra'ah. The, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which Satan wanted them to partake of. And, and of course, it happens. And when they partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they took a law. See, the law is okay. It teaches you right from wrong. Like Paul said, I had not known. But life is a law of love. Life, the tree of life didn't look very pretty when Jesus was hanging on it. But he was the fruit in him, his spirit, the spirit that he had the chaim in the plural in him because he was Adam. He was the second Adam. And in him was all that life. And that life was imparted upon us if we receive it. If we receive Barabbas, then you know what you will get. I'm Stephen Benoon. I really pray this message has been a real blessing to you today. Um, and if it is, and God lays upon your heart, believe me, there is not many people that like what we have to say. You want to support the work, we can always be blessed by your help. Uh, online, fastest way right there, or Danoon Institute, P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee. You can do it that way, or if you notice how my name is spelled, Stephen Benoon, B-E-N-N-U-N, um, you can, you can uh, donate either way. We thank you. God bless you. We love you. I know it's a hard message to take, but I pray that it's helpful to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I send with you his love. God bless you.